Well, thank you for inviting me here. Thank you to Torkel and the organizing committee. It's my second time giving lectures in Scandinavia. I was in Stockholm last year, um, well before all of this vaccine issue got highlighted, talking about a different topic on metabolic health. Uh, a little bit about a background about me. Um, so I'm a consultant cardiologist. I've been a qualified doctor now for well over 20 years. I spent most of my career working in the NHS. I've had a number of different roles over the years, working with medical establishment committees, tackling issues like too much medicine, obesity. Um, I was a lead campaigner in, in bringing about the um, awareness on sugar, excess sugar consumption, the harms of sugar in the UK. Um, and then more recently, I've now got a role as a president of a, a new charity called the Public Health Collaboration. Um, obviously, I'm speaking today in a personal capacity. I'm not representing any organization. Uh, but um, before, before I start the actual lecture, I think there are two psychological concepts that I want us to think about a little bit that are, we, we are vulnerable to as humans, all of us. The first one is fear. And the, the issue with fear is there is almost an inverse correlation with fear and the ability to engage in critical thinking. And that's really important when we think about the pandemic and how it's affected all of us over the last couple of years. Certainly at the very beginning, most of us were gripped by a fear we'd never experienced in our lives. And I think many people are still experiencing a form of post-traumatic stress disorder. And, and of course, this is really crucial in trying to understand why there are people on the other side who may not be as enlightened to us uh, as us when it comes to the evidence on COVID and the COVID vaccine. The other psychological phenomenon, which is again a big challenge, is one called willful blindness. So this is when human beings turn a blind eye to the truth in order to feel safe, to avoid conflict, to reduce anxiety, and to protect prestige, or in many cases, precious, fragile egos. But how do we combat this? Well, I would say there are two things. The way that we combat this is one with cold, hard facts, persistence, but also with compassion. We have to have empathy for people on the other side who do not necessarily understand what we understand. Yeah? And but that doesn't mean we're not assertive. So what I would say is, and by the end of the talk, I think you'll get more of an understanding about how we move forward constructively, is we need to talk about compassionate courage. Okay, let's, let's get started. So what's worse, what's worse than ignorance? According to the late, great Stephen Hawking, the illusion of knowledge. The World Health Organization haven't done many things very well, but there's one thing I really like about uh, some of their work, and it's their definition of health. So let's take a step back, because ultimately, for me as a doctor, my role or my, um, uh, the purpose for me, for example, gaining knowledge, or the ultimate reason for, uh, of gaining knowledge is to reduce human suffering. But um, let's define health, which is a WHO definition. So health is a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being, not merely the absence of disease and infirmity. What about public health? I'm a public health campaigner. This issue is a public health issue. And there's a couple of good definitions there. So the science and art of promoting health, preventing disease, and prolonging life through organized efforts of society. And also to ensure and create the conditions for the highest possible level of health and well-being of populations consistent with the values of social justice and human rights. So if we start from this place of understanding health and public health, we can try and see, does the current narrative, does the current policies, does the, uh, the practice of, of, of medicine, actually, in totality, is it fitting with these ideals? And of course, I'm sure all of you know, the answer is no, it isn't. And the question is why? So in the UK, uh, I don't know what your stats are in Norway, but I mean, this is a global issue in general. So we've had a, a big problem of stalling of life expectancy in the last 10 years. And what's worse is that there are more and more people living with chronic illness. So in a way, we can say that actually, certainly in the UK and in many parts of the world, in many pockets, I'm sure, in Norway, in America, all over the world, in many ways, our health is not progressing, 
it is regressing. It's going in the wrong direction. So I spent a good probably nine months from when I conceived the idea to write this article to it finally being published. And just to um, bust some myths out there, when you speak truth to power, and I've been doing in this as an advocate and as an activist for many years, there is always going to be uh, pushback, uh, and sometimes very nasty and malicious. And there are blogs, and you, know, you can find scores of articles of blogs and people being defamatory towards my work at, at times. Um, but just to be, make it very clear, so I published this article in the Journal of Instant Resistance, and the reason I chose this journal is, one, it's a journal that doesn't take money from the drug industry, okay? And the other reason is, I thought this problem was so huge, and we had to overcome it with, um, uh, with a careful walking through people through the facts of, of the situation of the vaccine in particular, that it was the only journal that would allow me to write 10,000 words, and in fact, it was broken into two parts. And the first part is explaining the science, which I'm going to go into around the vaccine shortly. And the second part is also the solutions and the structural drivers that al allowed the situation to happen in the first place. Because without understanding the whole range of the problem, our solutions are going to be flawed. Yeah? We have to understand the root cause of the problem. So you know, a treatment based upon a faulty causal analysis will lead to the wrong outcome. And we talk about this in the, in, from a perspective of how we manage patients, but also we can think about it in the broader societal approach to improving people's health. So, probably one of the most important slides, feel, feel free to take a screenshot of this. It's a very elegant analytical framework that we use to teach and practice medicine. And this is the evidence-based medicine triad. Okay? I actually think if people understand this properly, you can solve most of the world's problems, not just medicine, just from this concept. So what do we do? We want to improve patient outcomes. What does that mean? Relieve suffering, treat illness, and manage risks. How do we do that? We use our clinical experience, our individual clinical expertise as doctors or healthcare practitioners, our knowledge, the best available evidence, and last but not least, which is probably the most important, taking into consideration individual patient preferences and values. And to do that properly, that means informed consent. And patients that are not fully informed, that's not informed consent. It's not consent at all, actually. But the problem is this. Evidence-based medicine has become an illusion. Evidence-based medicine has been hijacked by big pharma, by vested interests. And <laughs> And what that means, unfortunately, the best available evidence, um, if one thinks about the fact that we are making clinical decisions on biased and commercially corrupted information, we at best are going to get suboptimal outcomes for our patients, and at worst, we're going to do them harm. Right? So this is actually a very nice way of understanding the bigger picture. But let's just break it down now. So I would say we have a complete healthcare system failure and a pandemic of misinformed doctors and misinformed and unwittingly harmed patients based upon a number of factors. Bias funding of research. Research that's funded because it's likely to be profitable, not beneficial for patients. Bias reporting in medical journals. Bias patient pamphlets. Bias reporting in the media, we'll talk about that in a bit of depth later. Commercial conflicts of interest, defensive medicine, and last but not least, medical curricula that fail to teach doctors how to comprehend and communicate health statistics. Without under I'm, I'm a numbers person, I love numbers. I, I, I loved mathematics at school, I excelled in it, I love numbers, but it's not complicated. One of my jobs as a doctor is to break down complex information into a way that's understandable for the public and for patients. And without understanding the numbers involved, doctors, patients, and the public are vulnerable to exploitation of their hopes and fears by political and commercial interests. Think about how that has been utilized, that exploitation throughout the pandemic, even in terms of people understanding their risk of COVID as well. Okay, so I... Um, I always look to, uh, you know, when I do my work, I don't just rely on my own analyses. I always try and 
get it critiqued. I go to people who have more knowledge than me on certain areas. I want to just always do better uh, as a doctor, and ultimately as a doctor as well. You know, my job is to do the best possible what I can do for my patient, but that also means evolving with the science, understanding, um, you know, the broader picture of things. And I would describe John Ioannidis, who wrote this paper, which is a great paper. You can download it, look it up, and um, Google search it and, and read it. It's an amazing paper um, he wrote in 2017. John Ioannidis, professor of medicine at Stanford. I would describe him as being a Stephen Hawking-like figure in medicine. He is the most cited medical researcher in the world. So when anything controversial is going on, I always say, well, what does John Ioannidis say? Because he's, he's a genius, but he also has very high integrity. So he wrote this paper, How to Survive the Medical Misinformation Mess, and these are the key points. He says, much published research, I would say probably most is at least misleading, not reliable, offers no benefit to patients, and is not useful to decision makers. Most healthcare professionals are not aware of this problem. Right? So don't expect or think your doctor knows, knows this. Most doctors go into the profession because they genuinely want to do their best for patients. That is their primary motivation. So they're not aware of this problem about the research that they are making clinical decisions on. They then also lack the necessary skills to evaluate the reliability and usefulness of medical science. I would say that a doctor is, who does not have critical appraisal skills is, um, you know, not doing his best for patients in the same way. It's, it's, it's actually a handicap as much as a doctor that doesn't know how to use a stethoscope. Okay, so it's really important that doctors keep up to date with the evidence. But again, this is an issue of training as well. And then patients and families frequently lack relevant, accurate medical evidence and skill guidance at the time of medical decision making. And this is something even I can tell you my own experience, working with many people, Royal College presidents, you know, um, I've, I've, in, my, in my life, I've had one-on-one -on -one meetings, private meetings with Secretary of State for Health, three different Secretary of State for Health in the UK. Um, and, the, and the issue that I've just described, that John Anidas describes, you know, ignorance of this problem is even at the highest levels of academic and clinical leadership, which is profound. And I remember once I was aware of issues with the vaccine, well over a year ago, uh, in the UK, they came out and suggested we should introduce a, a, a mandate for NHS staff, for medical staff. And I thought, hold on, this is not right. This is, doesn't make any sense. At that stage, I realized there was harms going on. And I remember having a conversation with the chairman of the British Medical Association at the time. I rang him up because he was having meetings with Secretary for Health and said, you need to get this overturned. You know, this is unethical. It's unscientific. And we're going to lose NHS staff. About 80,000 staff in the National Health Service had dug their heels in and said, we're not going to have the vaccine, but they were about to lose their jobs. And I remember when I chatted to him, he, he listened to me for two hours on the phone. I was in America at the time. And I said, listen, you need to hear me out. I'm going to talk you through what the issue of the vaccine is. And he, he said to me, he said, Asim, of all the people I've spoken to, and he speaks to people like the chief medical officer, people in health policy, he said, nobody, from what, I've, what you've told me, nobody appears to have critically appraised the evidence as much as you have. He said, most of my colleagues are getting their information on the vaccine from the BBC. Okay? No, you need to appreciate, it's really important to appreciate that. Rochelle Walensky, the chair of the CDC, said originally, when it came out with the vaccine, when she realized that we thought it was gonna prevent infection and transmission, then it didn't, she said her optimism from the vaccine came from CNN, a CNN news report. Now, that CNN news report she was referring to, and we're going to get into the, I'm going to get deep into this in a second, was actually a verb, almost verbatim reproduction of a press release on the original trial from Pfizer. So what she's actually saying is, I got my understanding about the efficacy of the vaccine from Pfizer. And we'll, we'll, we'll talk about how reliable Pfizer is shortly, okay, <laughs> what we really think of Pfizer and those companies. What else does John I need to say? Okay, in, his, in a different uh, publication many years ago called Why Most Published Research Findings Are False, I know it's not great, we can do better. Um, he, he actually said this, he said, the greater the financial and other interests and prejudices in, the, in a scientific field, the less likely the research findings are to be true. Does that sound familiar? Yeah? Okay. Let's take another step back. Let's try and understand the different interests involved and how that's shaping medical discourse. So in 2018, I've, I've campaigned actually for many years on um, trying to get an inquiry and expose all of the shortcomings of the drug industry and how that re results in harming patients because of exaggerated safety and benefits of their drugs. And in 2018, I went and spoke in the European Parliament, and I made a few key points there in lectures which I've given over the years. 
and I said this. So first and foremost, pharmaceutical companies and medical device companies have a fiduciary obligation to produce profit for their shareholders. They do not have a legal obligation to give you the best treatment. Although most people would believe or like this to be the case, this isn't true legally. So you have to understand that. And, but, but this is the issue. The real scandals are that medical regulators fail to prevent misconduct by industry and that doctors, institutions, and journals that have responsibilities to patients and sci scientific integrity collude with industry for financial gain. And because of that, I said this, I said honest doctors can no longer practice honest medicine and we have a complete healthcare system failure and this epidemic of misinformed doctors and misinformed and harmed patients. Okay, so what about the history? What's the track record of the drug industry in terms of what they're doing to society, history of fraud, for example? So Peter Gosha, the co-founder of the Cochrane Collaboration, he's Danish, as you may know, um, he basically, this, in an article in the BMJ a few years ago, makes a few, a few sort of really important points. The first broad picture issue, which is still a problem, according to his own analysis, the third most common cause of death after heart disease and cancer globally is prescribed medications what your doctor prescribes for you. And it's because of side effects. And most of those are preventable. And again, a lot of these prescriptions are based upon exaggerated benefits and safety of those drugs. He also points out as well, so we know between 2009, 2014, most of the top 10 drug companies had paid fines totaling around $13 billion for hiding data on harms, illegal marketing uh, you know, of drugs, um, distortion of, of, of research findings. You know, these are the kind of, this is the typical, if you like, I would say, actually, um, the business model, I think there's very good evidence to, to say this. I don't want to sound alarmist. I'm just, I'm here to give you my evidence-based opinion, but with cold, hard facts. Unfortunately, the business model of the drug companies, and many companies, multinational big corporations, is fraud, right? That's their business model. What does that mean, fraud? Deliberate deception in order to make money. Okay, so people may stop me for a second. They said, hold on, Dr. Malhotra. But what about all these life-saving treatments and all these amazing drugs that they've produced? Okay, I would say there, that does exist, but let's try and put it in context. So this analysis was done. There's another really good paper, uh, the, myth, the, the Myth of Safe and Effective Drugs, Institutional Corruption of the Pharmaceuticals and the Myth of Safe and Effective Drugs. So if one looks at, for example, this was a sample taken in France, looking at about 1,000 drugs that were approved between 2000 and 2011. What do we know when, when it was independently analyzed about the effect of these drugs? Most of the drugs, at least 50%, were essentially copies of old ones. So the drug companies, because they spend about 19 times more on marketing than they do on research uh, of new molecular entities, if you like, basic science, 19 times more spending on that, they are essentially, what they're doing is just changing a few molecules here and there on drugs, um, and then patenting it making lots of money, and then they move on to the next one, right? So we are, there's a colossal amount, a huge amount of waste there. But what was more interesting from this is if you look here, I don't know if this will, yeah, okay. So if you look here, of those 1,000, about 1,000 drugs, 15.6% of them were found to be more harmful than beneficial, and the ones that were truly innovative was about 8%. Okay, so almost double the amount of drugs that were produced, remember most of the other ones are copies of old ones, were causing more harm than good. So what's the ultimate conclusion of this? I think it's unequivocal. The overall net effect, and this is over the last few decades, the overall net effect of the pharmaceutical industry on society in the last few, few decades has been a hugely negative one. Right? We're not talking about the fact there are some drugs that are great, we're talking what is the overall net effect of that? Okay, and it's been negative. So, then this has been replicated. Marcy Angel, the former editor of the New England Journal of Medicine, uh, highest impact medical journal in the world, she, her own analysis showed that of the 667 drugs approved by the FDA between 2000 and 2008, 75% uh, were essentially copies of old ones, only 11% were found to be truly innovative. What else did she say? And this is the former editor of the New England Journal of Medicine. It is no longer possible to trust much of the clinical research that's published or to rely on the judgment of trusted physicians or authoritative medical guidelines. I take no pleasure in this conclusion, which I reached slowly and reluctantly over my two decades as editor of the New England Journal of Medicine. She's not alone. Editor of The Lancet, Richard Horton. In fact, he came to my talk on Monday in, in London. I didn't know he was there. I met him in the street and he said, I'm going to come to your talk. And he sent me a very positive, I won't share it with you, it's a private conversation, but he sent me a positive message afterwards because I name-checked him. In an editorial he wrote in 2015, 
um, in a meeting that he attended, organized by the Wellcome Trust, with some of the top academics in the world. It was Chatham House Rules, so he didn't name them. He said, possibly half of the published literature, medical literature, may simply be untrue. Richard Smith, former editor of the BMJ, talks about this problem in British institutions. And he wrote about this a couple of years ago, where he said that he attended a, a conference of academics. And during the conference, he said to the academics that were there, from very prestigious institutions in, in the UK, he said, how many of you are aware of a colleague that has committed a fabricated research or, or committed fraud, essentially, or you know, fraudulent research, been involved in it? And a third of the audience put their hand up. He said, how many of you have reported it? They all put their hand down. Okay? So there's a cultural problem here, which I'm going to get to the roots of. Okay? We're getting there. We're getting there. So what's going on? What's going on? And then this stuff, this situation, I mean, this is, what I'm about to show you is really quite extraordinary. And this, I think people need to understand as well, for academics, it's not just about, money is not really the main driver. Okay? Uh, academics get a lot of power and prestige just from publication. So there's a pressure to publish and reproduce publications. And of course, that increases the chances of people doing, you know, engaging in misdemeanors. And of course, if drug industry involved, then they've got that extra money and protection potentially as well. But one of the worst that I've heard of that we know of is actually a Dutch researcher who was found guilty for fraudulent research in relation to his publications, many, many publications, that influenced European Society of Cardiology guidelines on the use of beta blocker drugs in non-cardiac surgery. So people going, undergoing surgery, he put forward essentially saying, if you give them a beta blocker before surgery, it's going to give some extra protection on strain on the heart, in essence. It was found to be fraudulent. And then when they, you know, he was fired from his job in, in Holland, and it was, it was estimated that because of his fraudulent research, it suggested there may have been 800,000 excess patient deaths in Europe, okay? But just from this one drug in one specific situation, this should have been headline world news, right? Most people don't know this, right? This is extraordinary. So I initially started my campaigning over 10 years ago. Initially, I was involved in trying to tackle the obesity epidemic and what needs to be done around food industry. I married that with, again, realizing we have an over-medicated population and what should we should do. So in my you know, writings, I started writing for the BMJ, and then you know, I got invited to committees, etc. And um, I spent about a year working with the medical royal colleges. And the medical royal colleges in the UK essentially represent every doctor in the UK. So I sat around a table with royal college presidents, and I said, listen, the BMJ launched this campaign in 2012 called Too Much Medicine. In fact, the BMJ had been a leading light in this, highlighting most of these issues, which is, which is a real testament to his former editor, Richard Smith, and then Fiona Godley, who's now retired. Um, and I got them. I said, listen, we need to combine a camp. We need, to, we need to have a campaign with the BMJ and the medical royal colleges to wind back the harm to Too Much Medicine, which actually makes sure that we make the ethical care of the patient its first priority by understanding all these problems, um, and then implementing solutions. And you know, I was lead author on this paper. And some of the co-authors was the chair of the General Medical Council and also the chair of the medical colleges. And one of the things we highlight in their paper is understanding also about the waste issue, uh, is that doctors have an ethical responsibility to reduce waste use of clinical resources because in a healthcare system with finite resources, one doctor's waste is another patient's delay. If many of us are climbing up the wrong wall, doing operations and procedures and giving drugs that are not going to be beneficial for patients. Think about all that time that takes, and that will distract from patients who really need care, right? And that causes delays in the system. Okay, let's move on to health statistics. This is really important to understand a lot of these issues, and then we'll get into detail on the vaccine. So um, bear with me on this. Again, this is, again, not rocket science. I think, you know, this is a, a, a secondary school um, you know, pupil, if I was, could understand this quite easily. So I'll just talk you through the numbers in very basic terms, right, to see how these misleading statistics are influencing behavior and opinions. So there are many ways of presenting a benefit. We can use something called relative risk or absolute risk reduction, okay? Also known, known as numbers needed to treat. So absolute risk reduction is also known as numbers needed to treat. So if you communicate relative risks as opposed to absolute risk, it can lead lay people and doctors to exaggerate or overestimate the benefits of a medical intervention. So let me give you an example. From a randomized control trial, yes, OK, drug industry sponsored, et cetera, OK, but let's look at the randomized control trial to look at the benefit of the use of a statin, a cholesterol-lowering drug, in patients with type 2 diabetes to see how useful is taking a statin at preventing them having a stroke over a four-year period. So if you look at it from a relative risk term, there's a 48% relative risk reduction in having a stroke over four years. Now, that sounds quite impressive. Imagine in a consultation, a, doctor, a patient comes to me who's got type 2 diabetes, and I say to them, listen, if you take this pill now, 
every day, take this pill, you're 48% less likely to have a stroke. That sounds quite impressive, doesn't it? And a patient receiving that says, oh, wow, okay. Okay, doctor, I'll take that pill. What did the actual, what, where does that 48% figure come from? Okay, if there are 28 in 1,000 people who are on the dummy pill in the trial being followed up, if 28 out of 1,000 have a, have a stroke out of 1,000 over four years, in the 1,000 people that were taking the pill, only 15 had a stroke, okay? So you've actually reduced the number of strokes by 13 in 1,000, yes? Does that make sense, right? So relative risk reduction is 15 over 28 times 100, right? Sorry, 13 over 28 times 100, which is 48%, yeah? Following me? That's a 48% relative risk reduction, but the actual risk reduction is 1.3%, right? So what that means is there's a 1.3% chance of an individual of it preventing them having a stroke if they take the drug religiously over four years. Another way of saying it, which is what I do with my patients consistently, I convert that 1.3% 1 in, 1 into 1 in 77. So what I will say to my patient is, if you take this drug religiously every day for the next four years, if we believe the drug industry-sponsored research, and you don't get side effects, likely best case scenario. This is also part of the conversation, it's really important. I always say this to my patients, right? I said there's a one in 77 chance it will prevent you having a stroke. <laughs> yeah, that's how we should be doing it. And, but most doctors don't do this. And patients will differ. In the, some of them actually will take the pill and say, okay, I'll take that, doctor. Others will say, no, I don't want it. And whatever they decide, I support their decision. That is ethical, evidence-based medical practice. That is the informed consent aspect, okay? <laughs> but if you look historically, mismatch framing in medical journals compounds the issue. So what ends up happening is, in the results of the trial, this is extraordinary, often the medical journal in a drug trial will report the benefits in relative risk and the harms in absolute risk. Right? And we look at a sample between, in the BMJ, the Lancet, and JAMA between 2004 and 2006. This is taken from a reference from a book. A third of all articles published uses mismatch framing. And of course, this is called asymm asymmetric presentation of data, you know, is of, of benefits and harms. is going to bias towards showing greater benefits and diminishing the importance of the harms. This is not science. This is marketing. This is marketing, right? You could call it deliberate deception in order to make money, right? Couldn't you? Yeah, so it's fraud, yes? Yeah. Right, yeah. great. Now, don't, don't just take my word for it. In a World Health Organization bulletin in 2009, the leading researcher in the world on health and statistical literacy, Gerd Gigerenza, Max Planck Institute in Berlin, right? Alma mater of Albert Einstein. And I've met Gerd Gigerenza, an amazing man. He actually, in a bulletin, said this. He said, it is an ethical imperative that every doctor and patient understand the difference between absolute and relative risk to protect patients against unnecessary anxiety and manipulation. So this is also in our paper, in the Choosing Wisely paper. And then what about the evidence around this? So I wrote a case study a few years after this BMJ paper with the chair of medical colleges. I wrote this uh, case study and said, actually, what's really interesting, you look at the evidence. When you have these conversations with patients, patients tend to be more conservative and it doesn't reduce, uh, it make, the outcomes are still as good, right? So you get a reduction in overtreatment, less surgery, less drug taking, and the outcomes don't change. So that's a huge potential cost saving, and patients feel more empowered, and it's of course more ethical. So we wrote this paper, and it was based upon a case study of a chap, I'll tell you very briefly, a lot of my work has been about reversing heart disease, the root cause of heart disease, how lifestyle plays a role in that. And a very interesting patient that came to see me a few years ago was a chap called Tony Royal. He was a former, he was then actually, a, well, a former Virgin Atlantic International Airline pilot. He used to run marathons. He was following standard low-fat, high-carb diet advice. He was gaining weight. And then in his 50s, he suffered a heart attack. He couldn't believe it. He had a stent put in. He couldn't fly anymore. He went back to teaching maths and physics. Very good at statistics. Started looking at the research on the drugs he was taking. He was feeling terrible, got horrible side effects, and gradually started reducing his, uh, his drugs and felt like a new man again. Lost weight had followed, read about my work on diet, had followed my dietary advice, and, and, you know, and then a few years later, now he's, you know, I'm still in touch with him, and he's six years. Is this an example of what you can achieve? This is a guy who had a heart attack, had a stent, was put on a cocktail of medications, and changed his lifestyle, and now he's breaking his own records in Ironman and ultramarathons, right? So this is what can potentially be achieved through lifestyle. And that's actually the big issue. The bigger issue is how do we shift the population towards more lifestyle, and less drug taking. And this isn't just about personal responsibility. I know there are lots of structural drivers, which I'm going to get into in a minute. And very briefly, I know you've, you want to hear about the vaccine stuff. We're getting there. 
but the background is really important to understand. During the pandemic at the very beginning, I had realized, like many other doctors, there was a clear link between excess body fat and poor outcomes from COVID. When you exclude elderly paid people, the biggest risk factor for poor outcomes from COVID was obesity. And I knew from my own work and research and advocacy that dietary changes very quickly, within a few weeks, can start to improve risk factors. But where was the messaging, the public health messaging? It was, it was non-existent. That should have been part of the approach. Many people died unnecessarily that probably wouldn't have died from COVID if they were given very strict advice. We could have had a, you know, we had daily briefings from the prime minister and the chief medical officer about stay at home, protect the NHS, save lives. It was all about lockdown. There was nothing about every day. Why did they say stay at home, eat real food, right? And save the NHS and save your own life, right? That should have been part of the message. So. I wrote this article in European Scientist eventually, and I broke through into the mainstream. Eventually, I was just really persistent. Um, I remember colleagues in America, many leading doctors said, Asim, how have you got this into the mainstream in the UK? We can't get it in the mainstream in the US. And I just kept pushing it, and then it became a front page story, a uh, link story on the Daily Telegraph. And I mentioned that our Prime Minister, Boris Johnson, who got in, because I, I used to uh, advise the London Food Board when he was mayor of, Man uh, mayor of London, and I worked with people very close to him, and they were very concerned about his weight. So I knew that he had a major weight issue. And I said, it's likely that that played a role in his hospitalization. Um, and then, you know, that's the other thing is that poor diet, of course, is a big risk factor for uh, poor COVID outcomes. And that was one of the pull quotes. And then I went on Good Morning Britain and on BBC News and I said, Boris has likely got sick because of his weight. And this is an opportunity. And they, they, the media lapped it up, actually. They wanted to keep talking about it. And then it became a big story. The Times then reported it on it, right? Now, this isn't about, you know, this isn't about fat shaming or anything else at all. This is actually, if the prime minister is vulnerable to the food environment misinformation, what hope have the rest of the population got, right? That's the point. So it was like, this is an opportunity. Then Matt Hancock, um, I had exchanges with him. I said, listen, we need to regulate the food industry here. So we had, and he had asked me to advise him. And then they, 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 and the problem with this is it's great rhetoric, but they haven't implemented anything, any, any policies to combat the food industry. Right? And then now we know, as it moved on, as, as things evolved, we know that 90% of the deaths from COVID globally happened in countries where the, um, more than 50% of the population were overweight or obese. Right? So that we know it's very clearly linked now. And there's lots of reasons for that, which is not the purpose of this talk, but essentially excess body fat, chronic inflammation, dysregulated immune system, all of these things play in. But the good news is if people do lose weight or people do improve their diet, very quickly you can improve your immune system. Okay, um, and uh, yeah, so let, let's move on from there. There was something else I was going to say, but I forgot what it was. I'll, I'll come back to it. Okay, vaccine. So Aga was asking me, lots of other people are asking me, hold on a minute, you've, you've come full circle on this vaccine issue. How did you get deceived? Or how did... Now, when the whole vaccine rollout started, I think for me personally, so I was one of the first to have the, the two doses of the Pfizer vaccine. And the, for me, it was multifactorial. First and foremost... I, I knew my risk from COVID was low, but there were two things that were working for me to have the vaccine early on. One was, I'm a doctor, and you know, I've had many vaccines in my life. It's something we routinely do. Two, I actually genuinely believed I was going to be protecting patients. Three, I never conceived of the possibility at all. I didn't conceive of it. That I, was, I was skeptical about the efficacy, don't get me wrong, but I never thought a vaccine could do any harm, right? Not to a significant degree, and certainly not to the heart. I didn't even think it was possible. And it's, it's really important for people to understand that. When I came out, I thought, I need to, I, we need to try and engage with the doctors who are still willfully blind, okay? And maybe one way of doing that for me is to say, listen, I was you, and I've changed my opinion, so at least listen, hear me out, right? Because that, so I went on Good Morning Britain, and a famous film director who's a friend of mine was vaccine hesitant, and some of the things that she was getting were, is clearly nonsense. I honestly don't believe it. There may be people who disagree with me, and that's fine. We'll agree to disagree. It's part of a depopulation agenda. You know, there is uh, microchips in the vaccine. That was the kind of stuff she was getting. I said, listen, this sounds like complete nonsense. And what I said at Good Morning Britain, I wasn't there to point fingers and say, you bloody anti-vaxxers, you're crazy. I didn't do any of that at all. I went on there and said, listen, there are rational reasons for vaccine hesitancy, and there are irrational reasons. Irrational are some of the things I've discussed already, but the rational ones are these, and I said it very clearly. You can look at that clip. I said, look at the history of the drug industry. Look at the fraud that they've committed. Look at the too much medicine. Look at the fact that the third most common cause of death after heart disease and cancer are prescribed medications. But I said, even when you take that in its totality, traditional vaccines compared to many of the other drugs we prescribe are still, and this is still the case, I'm not saying any, no drug is completely safe, 
right? But they are still far safer than all the other drugs we prescribe. And that's how I left it. That was my way of tackling it. I didn't say, and so I said, for me, you know, and I'd had it, and that, essentially that was the, uh, because people from lower socioeconomic back backgrounds and ethnic minority groups were amongst some of the people at the beginning who were the most vaccine hesitant. And then, you know, the situation involved, and just generally, I mean, if you look at traditional vaccines, you know, estimated to probably, you know, be responsible for saving four to five million lives, especially in developing countries, four to five million lives a year. So what changed? Okay, let's walk through this. So... Um, first and foremost, in, in July of 2021, actually before that, I, I met a, a cardiologist friend of mine, who I, dis I won't name him, but he's one of the brightest cardiologists in the country, very high integrity, uh, and uh, he met me, and I was a bit surprised, he's in his late 30s, and he met me in, say, April, May, and we're walking along, going for a coffee, and he said, Asim, I just want to let you know, you know I've not had the vaccine. I said, really? Why? He says, well, there's something that was, a, first and foremost, I wanted to wait and see. No, I know I'm low risk. He said, but the other reason is something, and this guy's a very, very clever guy. I mean, he can pull papers apart, like, almost like John Ioannidis, okay? And he said, there's something that disturbed me, and I hope, it, I hope it's not true, and this is my instinct. I haven't got good evidence for it, so I'm just going to tell you, but something disturbed me. I said, what is it? He said, if you look at the supplementary appendix in Pfizer's original trial, that led to the rollout of the Pfizer vaccine. He said there were four cardiac arrests in the vaccine group and one in the placebo. He says, I hope this signal is not correct, but if it's a real signal, he said, it's gonna be a mess. We are gonna see cardiac arrests happening, right? So I remember, I remember and I had a very pleasant conversation. I said, that's really interesting, mate. Um, and I thought about it. And then my dad has a cardiac arrest, unexpected in July, very fit guy. And his post-mortem findings didn't make sense to me. I knew his lifestyle habits inside out. I knew his heart. You know, we'd done some scans on a few. Everything was fine. But he had two critical narrowings in his arteries, which didn't make sense. And my research, my advocate, you know, I've done a lot of work on shifting the understanding of how heart disease develops. So I know this stuff better than anybody. And I thought, this doesn't make any sense. How has he had such rapid progression of his coronary artery disease? Um, and at that point, though, I didn't still, again, think it was a vaccine. I thought, you know, I'd lost my mom a few years ago. He's widowed. I mean, one of the other reasons, by the way, just to mention why I took the vaccine, my dad pressured me quite a lot. And I think part of the reason was he lost his uh, eldest son, my brother, when, he w when I was young. He lost his wife three years ago. Like many people, even though he was a very smart doctor, he was older, he was f gripped by fear by COVID. And in his mind, he thought, oh, my God, my only, my only surviving son. I don't want him to die from COVID. So he was on my case constantly to have the vaccine. So that's one of the reasons I actually had it as well, which I haven't made public before, but that's fine. So all this happened, and then three bits of data came together, and I thought, oh my God, okay, there's a problem here. The first one was, I was, I was actually in Stockholm last year, and I got contacted by the, a Times journalist and said, Dr. Malhotra, you're an expert on all the heart disease and how it can happen quickly and heart attacks. He says, um, there are reports from hospitals in Scotland that there's been a 25% increase in unexplained heart attacks. And she said to me, and I said, interesting, it's interesting, because in some ways I could have predicted lockdown was going to increase heart attacks, right? People's diets were getting worse, psychological stress, big risk factors for heart disease. I said, this is probably the role. And she said, what about the vaccine? I said, listen, I don't think so, but I said, I would be a poor scientist to not exclude it. So I said, I can't completely exclude it, but I think this is least likely. That's at that point. About two weeks later, an abstract was published in circulation by Stephen Gundry. And actually, in that abstract in circulation, he gave a mechanism. He was following up patients and found that there was huge, there was markers of coronary inflammation in the blood, massively increased within two to 10 weeks of people having two doses of the Pfizer, mRNA, Moderna or Pfizer. And I thought, oh God, okay, this doesn't look, this is interesting because if this is true, it increased people's risk from 11%, the baseline 11% risk of having a heart attack in five years to 25%. That's huge. That's a huge, into eight weeks. If I decided today that I was gonna start smoking 40 cigarettes a day, become completely sedentary, right, and eat junk food, I couldn't even increase my risk that much, right? So that was like, okay, even if this is partially true, there is a problem. Then I got contacted by a whistleblower at a very prestigious institution in the UK, which I won't name. Let's just say one of the most prestigious institutions in the world, right? And he's a cardiologist and he was very upset and he said, listen, um, I want to tell you something. I said, what is it? He said, a group of researchers in my department, cardiologists, through some, high, some specialized imaging techniques I've been using, have accidentally found that in vaccinated versus unvaccinated, there was huge inflammation going on in the coronary arteries. He said they then had a meeting, and they said, guys, a closed meeting, and they said, guys, we're not going to publish these findings because it may affect our funding from the drug industry. 
I then thought, okay, what can I do? I'm an advocate, I'm an activist, I'm like, what, what is the, sunlight is a very potent disinfectant, right? And mainstream media still has a most very powerful role in, in, in shining a light on these areas. So I contacted GB News and I said, listen, I want to come and talk about this. This is what I found. And I went on GB News, and you may be familiar with this, uh, this, um, uh, this video because it went viral. And I said, listen, I, you know, there are three bits of data here. This, this isn't definitive, but there is a signal. It needs investigating. And I asked those doctors in that institution, look in the mirror and remember what your duty is. Your duty is to patients and scientific integrity. Please do the right thing. So I did this video, and then after that, you know, it was interesting. I, um, and, and then I thought, I'm going to have to look at this data properly and critically appraise it. And that's when I spent nine months on publishing this paper. But in the meantime, what many people don't know, and this is part and parcel of, of what happens in these situations, speaking truth to power, behind the scenes, certain medical establishment bodies, which I won't name, who actually have a lot of power over my credentials as a doctor, were co had anonymous complaints made by doctors towards me that I was bringing the medical profession into disrepute, okay? Just by this interview, where I said we need to investigate it. So I had all this stuff going on, and I, can't, I was fine. It took several weeks, everything. So I thought, okay, listen, I can't just go out and be very clear and say on Twitter, you know, stop this jab, although that's what I, by that time, I'd come to that conclusion, said, what can we do here? How can I give myself the best opportunity, and others as well, for this to be credible, get it through a peer-reviewed medical journal? Right, let's go back in time. So the original trial, that led to the approval of the vaccine. The absolute risk reduction in preventing an infection was 0.84%. Okay, this is a Wuhan strain, Pfizer's randomized control trial, that led to the approval of the vaccine, all right, coercion and mandates. It meant, at best, if this is true, we don't have the raw data to know if it's exactly true, precise, at best, you have to vaccinate 119 people to prevent one person getting infected from COVID. Now, if there was no harm, who cares? Because if you think about giving it to tens of millions, hundreds of millions, potentially billions of people, you are potentially going to save many lives, right? If there is no harm, and if this is true, yes? But one thing that really surprised me, which I found out much later on, is the fact that people said, well, hold on, well, antibodies. You got antibodies. I had antibody tests done. Antibody oh, great, I'm protected. The FDA themselves, and I'll explain why this is, in May 2021, again, this wasn't publicized, but it's there on their website, they said, that the US FDA basically is reminding the public and healthcare providers that results from currently authorized SARS-CoV-2 antibody tests should not be used to evaluate a person's level of immunity or protection from COVID-19 at any time, especially after the person has received a COVID-19 vaccination. <laughs> that wasn't publicized though. People were relying on this. It's what we call a surrogate marker. And one of the reasons is this, is that the antibodies from this particular vaccine don't get into the respiratory mucosa, okay? And therefore, it's, it was never really going to prevent you getting infected. Let's be honest. It was never really going to prevent you getting infected with COVID. Whether or not it prevents Ill, serious illness and death, we'll get onto that, is another question. OK, so what about, so I thought, OK, what can I do? John Ionidis had written editorial, interestingly, saying the, the, what's missing from this conversation is a shared decision-making conversation of absolute benefits and harms from the vaccine. So could I calculate that? It's important to know that Pfizer's original trial didn't show any statistically significant reduction in COVID mortality and didn't show any reduction in all-cause mortality. So uh, we've got an RCT, which is the highest quality level of evidence, not showing a reduction in COVID death statistically significant, but showing a very small reduction in infection. So that was interesting. I thought, hold on, we can't then jump to saying the vaccine is definitely saving lives. That's, that's ridiculous from less quality, reliable data. So let's look at that in real-world setting. And I thought, well, actually, so we looked at the UK and we looked at the Delta wave. And what we found was, and by the way, this is still probably an exaggeration because it doesn't correct from what we call confounding factors. So let's say, for example, you're an unvaccinated person who's terminally ill. You decide not to have the vaccine because you're terminally ill. You're more likely to die from COVID. You then get classified as unvaccinated. But you're not the same as an 80-year-old who is perfectly well, right? So what that's going to do is it's going to shift towards the vaccine looking to have more benefit. So again, these figures are likely, most likely, an exaggerated benefit. So let's break it down for you. OK, so if, for example, and this is during the Delta wave, so we looked at 100, per 100,000 people vaccinated versus unvaccinated in terms of COVID death, and we found that if you are over 80, for example, oh, sorry, uh, if you're over 80, for example, then, there we go, you have to vaccinate 230 people to prevent one COVID death, OK? 
520 for 7 to 80, 1300. Now, what about Omicron from the beginning of this year? Delta was more lethal this year, which is still ongoing. Yeah, are you ready? 7,300 people over the age of 80 need to be vaccinated to prevent one COVID death. Likely still best case scenario. And it goes up as you get younger. That's what we should have been telling patients. If an 80-year-old patient comes to me now and he says, doctor, should I have this vaccine? To be honest, I can't really say that now because I've come out and said, listen, it needs to be ended for everybody, okay? But if I was to have a shared decision-making conversation, I would say, well, there's a one in 7,300 chance. If you have this COVID vaccine, it'll prevent you dying from COVID, right? But what are the harms, right? What are the harms? We'll get on to that in a second. And even Ioannidis himself, as I said, this is what he says. You know, what does the Stephen Hawking of medicine say? He also says, interestingly, of these non-randomized studies that I've highlighted about the benefits of the vaccine, he said, like, for example, this headline around the world, the vaccine saved 20 million lives, right? Lowest quality of evidence, modeling study, not real world, extrapolations from other trials, it's a mess, right? And he basically says, these conclusions may be spurious. They may be fake. That's what John Ioannidis thinks. What about reporting of evidence through the media? reporting of healthcare studies. Historically, this is published in JAMA, um, when you look at um, most healthcare reporting, they fail in terms of being satisfactory in at least five of 10 criteria, including um, cost, benefits, harms, quality of the evidence, comparison, the new approach with alternatives, right? So this is, now, this is crucial. Remember, a lot of health policy, people involved in health policy, even politicians, are getting their news through the media or getting their understanding of something. Uh, I don't know if this was picked up in Norway recently. So have you heard this one, the most recent one? The reason we're having heart attacks increase and sudden cardiac death and all that kind of thing, it's because of COVID. It's mild COVID now, <laughs> right? Mild COVID is behind it. Don't make, it can't be the vaccine. Don't be ridiculous. It's mild COVID. So I looked at what was the, um, the paper, the research paper that led to this headline, even mild COVID linked to heart disease and strokes. Is this true? No, no absolutely not. So if you look at the conclusions of the actual paper that led to this, this is from the very beginning, right? So we know that people with obesity and, and poor metabolic health were more vulnerable to dying. These people who had heart disease, for example, were more vulnerable to dying from COVID and actually would end up having heart attack, more heart attacks at the beginning. It was only in hospitalized people, people with severe COVID at the beginning, right? So, and they said that mild COVID, well, not hospitalized COVID, increases the risk of a, a lung clot, but nothing to do with heart disease and stroke. So this is false, right? But it gets even better, okay? Okay, five minutes, right. We'll have to, we'll, we'll go. So in our main analysis, we found an unexpected association of COVID-19 with lower risk of heart attack in the non-hospitalized subset. Their, their paper found mild COVID, and it's probably, this doesn't make sense, but if anything, the, the mild COVID meant you were less likely to have a heart attack. That's what the paper found. What else did they find, right? Over here. Our analysis does not consider other potential modifying factors such as the impact of vaccination. <laughs> I had a doctor who's well known who sent me this headline, didn't read the paper, and thought, Asim, are you sure you're right about the vaccine? I think it could be mild COVID, willful blindness. Right, I haven't got much time left, so I'm gonna whiz through these quickly. Is our regulator doing its job properly? Unfortunately not. So the regulators around the world, unfortunately, are co-opted by industry. The FDA gets 65% of their funding from industry. The regulator in the UK gets 86% of their funding from industry. And Donald Light in this BMJ piece essentially says that doctors and patients must appreciate how deeply and extensively drug regulators can't be trusted as long as they get industry funding. Now, what about the absolute harms? Now, this has now been published in peer-reviewed journal vaccine. This is the highest quality evidence going back to Pfizer and Moderna trials. And what they found was was in the actual randomized control trial, where everything is corrected for, you were more likely to suffer a serious adverse event, hospitalization, disability, et cetera, than you were to be hospitalized with COVID. So our original trial that led to the approval of the vaccine showed more harm than good for the overwhelming majority of people. This is extraordinary, of at least one in 800. The WHO endorsed this list before the vaccine rollout of what could potentially go wrong with the vaccine in terms of side effects. This is everything we're seeing in the community now. All of these, everything, this is their list. Take a screenshot of it. It's in my paper, actually. If you read my paper, it's in there, okay? Mechanism of harm, uh, I'm sure Ryan will talk about this later, but essentially, these lipid nanoparticles, spike protein, essentially, they don't stay in the, in the arm. They get distributed throughout, throughout the body for up to four months, maybe longer, and can cause either direct to toxicity to tissues or autoimmune reaction. We've had this big problem of increase in cardiac arrests. 
Um, and in fact, the best research that looked at this is Israel. They found a 25% increase in people between 16 and 39 having heart attacks or cardiac arrest linked to the vaccine not associated with COVID. Florida Surgeon General has also found a similar link. The British Heart Foundation recently have found uh, unexplained 30,000 excess, excess deaths specifically because of coronary artery disease. Most of it is being driven again, uh, by cardiovascular diseases as well. And they're, 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 we're not sure. It could be because of reduced waiting times, whatever. Clearly, the vaccine is, is definitely a factor. So in conclusion, essentially, you know, we are now in a situation where there is clear evidence of harm from highest quality evidence data. Um, just historically, you should know that other vaccines have been pulled for much less. So swine flu vaccine in 1976 was pulled because it caused Guillain-Barre syndrome in one in 100,000 people. Okay, rotavirus vaccine was pulled in 2006 because it caused uh, bowel obstruction in one in 10,000 kids. We've got at least one in 800 serious adverse events. And this is a no-brainer. This is not even, in normal circumstances, this wouldn't be debated. It would have been pulled a long time ago. We need, to, we need to think about this differently. Now, what's the root of the problem? I know I've just got a few minutes left, so bear with me. I might go slightly over, so I hope you can handle that, all right? Okay, slightly over. Are we okay if I just go a few more minutes, yeah? Okay. I believe in democracy, so I'll go very quickly. So what's the problem with all of this? What's driving population health problems? I call it the biopsychosocial health model, right? So this is conditions in which we are born, grow, live, work, age, right? And so chronic psychological stress is at the root of the problem. And if you look at what the drivers are, um, and this is linked to problems with heart disease, with cancer, this stress is a big issue, okay? And uh, let's just go a bit further forward. And, 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 and basically having a poor quality or stressful. Now, this is all linked to big corporations, ultimately. And we call this commercial de determinants of health, right? Strategies and approaches adopted by the private sector to promote products and choices that are detrimental to health. And you think about all these global drivers that are going on. Now, this is how um, the corporations exert their power and how they influence risk factors for disease in the population. So, for example, here, they have this, um, this dimension of power, a three-dimensional view, is they have the power to avert conflict and keep conflict latent, right? Conflict between the interests of the powerful and those over whom power is exerted. In other words, the general population doesn't know what's happening, and they don't even know that they don't know, right? Because they're able to suppress information through use of mass media, and then they capture the knowledge environment through medical education, they capture media, and therefore determines the dominant narrative, so people are only seeing one side of the story, and that influences risk factors for disease. And, and ultimately, we need to now focus on the corporation. Now, just last two minutes, I'm, I promise you I'm almost finished. Um, let's just give it, let's get to the real root of the problem, right? This is what I think the most important thing for people to understand as we move forward. We have historical evidence of these drug industry companies committing fraud. One of the most well-known is the Vioxx scandal, an anti-inflammatory drug ultimately pr produced by Merck, found to cause the deaths of tens of thousands of Americans and because through heart attacks. And John Abramson here discusses it with Joe Rogan. John Abramson's a researcher in Harvard. And he talks about he was involved in the litigation. And when the internal documents were found in the litigation, they found internal emails involving the chief scientist of Merck. When the drug was being rolled out, when it was being approved, they knew, right? And he said words to this effect in the email. It's unfortunate. It's a shame that the cardiovascular effect is there. But the drug will do well, and we will do well. <laughs> what do you call this kind of behavior? Criminal, yeah? OK. It's actually called psychopath, right? So, psychopathic. The world-leading researcher behind the definition of psychopath, Dr. Robert Hare, in the book The Corporation, actually says that the criteria of the entity that is a big corporation, not the individuals within them, it's the machine, behaves like a psychopath, OK? So, callous unconcern for the feelings of others, reckless disregard for the safety of others, deceitfulness, repeated lying and conning others for profit. What we are talking about now here, I think we should be talking about the psychopathic determinants of health. Because if you understand the machine that is a psychopath at the root of it, 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 it explains all of the downstream effects on the culture. Silences of whistleblowers, why you know, cardiologists in departments are not getting, you know, think about how that affects the brain and how it affects our behavior and drives us away from what, actually, what it means to be human. Fauci talked about trust the science, right? In effect, what he was really saying unwittingly was trust the psychopath, right? That's ultimately what he was saying. We're not being alarmist here, I'm being evidence based, yeah? <laughs> I've been banned on Facebook a few times. I didn't know Facebook had, guess who Facebook had partnered with to, to tackle vaccine misinformation on their platform? Merck, right? These are the people that are determining our narrative. I've suffered as well 
in, because of healthcare system failings. You know, I've written about this. Um, my mum, for example, had lots of problems related to her weight and ultra-processed food. They're both doctors. You know, and also, for me, this has become a, a personal issue. So how, what do we do moving forward? How do we actually tackle this? We've got to move a mountain, right? So we create the relevant knowledge, independent, clear knowledge. We get that information disseminated to the social movement here. Even 400 people here is magnificent, right? This, we all have the power to change our lives and other people's lives through the power of our speech, through speaking the truth. There's nothing more powerful. But we need political involvement as well. Now, how do the politicians get? Well, social media is one route, but mainstream media as well. And that's going to be the hard part. And ultimately, you know, uh, public health, we need to, uh, science evolves. 50% of what you learn in medical school will turn out to be either outdated or dead wrong within five years of your graduation. The trouble is nobody can tell you which half, so you have to learn to learn on your own. And ultimately, you know, we have to just keep speaking out, and then we will get there. And I've, you know, involved in the... I'm, I'm sorry, I'm going for it because we're running out of time. This is my fault. Um, I helped overturn the vaccine mandate. People contacted me in tears, and I said, listen, we'll get this overturned. I kept working on the chair of the BMA. I got messages to the Secretary of State for Health. I went on mainstream media. And ultimately, what we need to do, the solutions are these, right? So the drug companies have an important role in developing new drugs. They should play no role in testing them, right? They should certainly not be able to hold on to the results. The regulators shouldn't be allowed to get money from industry. Independent researchers should be able to disseminate this information. Medical education should not be funded or sponsored by the pharmaceutical industry. I've stopped going to conferences, cardiology conferences, sponsored by the drug industry because I know the information I'm going to receive there is not going to be reliable. We've got a crisis of trust. Last few slides. OK. Apologies. So what do we need to do moving forward? We need to, we need to just get from, we disconnect from the corporation in terms of funding. We need to reframe the debate what we are fighting here is something that is anti-human, OK? We are, we are, as Marcy Angel told me in an interview I did when I wrote for The Guardian, she said the real battle in healthcare is one of truth versus money, OK? So, and then let's, Abraham Lincoln predicted this situation. It's an ongoing problem over the last couple of centuries. He says, I see in the near future a crisis approaching that unnerves me and causes me to tremble for the safety of my country. Corporations have been enthroned, and an era of corruption in high places will follow, and the money power of the country will endeavor to prolong its reign by working upon the prejudices of the people until all the wealth is aggregated in a few hands and the republic is destroyed. Let's think about spirituality a little bit more. What does it actually mean to be human as well? This is what we're battling now, right, internally as well. The late Robert Kennedy, the gross national product does not allow for the health of our children, the quality of their education, uh, or the joy of their play. It does not include the beauty of our poetry or the strength of our marriages, the intelligence of our public debate, or the integrity of our public officials. It measures neither our wit nor our courage, neither our wisdom nor our learning, neither our compassion nor our devotion to our country. It measures everything in short except which makes life worthwhile. And to lead the good and happy life, we have to go back to the basics of living virtuously, right? Let's think about those values. And of all those virtues, the most important is courage. Because without courage, you cannot practice any other virtue consistently. We need to fight for, the, for, for, for humanity now. This is what the situation we're in, right? And we can do that through the power of our speech. And one of my inspirations, Mahatma Gandhi, it's health that, the re is, the, that is the real wealth, not pieces of gold and silver. And, my, and, and basically, let's rise up. Let's really rise up against this organization of misery. Rights are only won by those who make their voices heard. Hope is never silent. And I'll finish with this. It's a difficult situation we're in. But we are moving forward. The movement is growing. We need to be persistent. And you know, uh, we will get there. Martin Luther King said, if you can't drive, you run. If you can't run, you walk. If you can't walk, you crawl, but keep moving forward. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.